So we have T.D. Jakes talking about water baptisms and all kinds of baptisms and that do this and that, and he's not really being scriptural because he's not reading scripture by context. Anyway, so we're looking at what the Bible says. What's the Christian water baptism defined? And this is, there are seven baptisms, by the way. This is the third of three wet baptisms, three which are symbolic, representative identification. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Here is a, a commandment, which is very clear and definitive, that we are as the representatives, the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, as we go through the world explaining the gospel of salvation unto eternal life to people. Winning them to the Lord, so, so called. I don't know, I don't like that baptism term, winning them. You present the case that they should identify themselves symbolically, they get the water baptism, that i.e. that they should portray their actual identification with Jesus Christ in a symbolic way with water baptism. In other words, water here represents the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When a church-age believer is immersed in water, he is portraying symbolically that it has been placed into Christ. The water represents Jesus Christ. You go into the water, you portray that you have been joined to Christ. When you come out of the water, that action is representative of a new lifestyle. The water baptism portrays the reality of what Paul is saying about in Romans 6, 3 to 4, which really, reality, is Holy Spirit baptism into Christ. Not, that isn't, you know, that reality is Holy Spirit baptism in Christ. That's not water baptism, and which water baptism portrays symbolically. And this is what Paul says, Romans 6, 3 to 4. A lot of people make a mistake on this. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Note that this portrays an actual baptism identification into Christ Jesus and his death. Holy Spirit baptism. And I'm going to say here, not, so many people say this, not water baptism. Uh, this computer baptism. All right, we got that? So, verse 4, Romans 6, 4, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So, when you are water baptized as a Christian, you go under the water. You associate yourself symbolically with the actual Holy Spirit identification with the death of Christ. Thus, you are saying, I am through with attempting to do human good in order to work my way into heaven, my trust is in Christ alone for that. You come up from the water, and thus you are associating yourself with the resurrection of Jesus Christ with your current position in him. And the result now is divine good production in your life. That there's a lot to go to understand that. It doesn't happen automatically. So that this is the testimony you are making when you get water baptized. I have a, an opportunity to participate in a new life. Now, I've read Romans chapter 6. It's an admonition. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. So we can go on sinning because God's grace will increase because his son covered all those sins. So you have to volunteer your life. And that takes the Holy Spirit working in you from the Holy Spirit baptism when you believed and studying the scriptures and circumstances the God bringing into your life to respond and be a faithful Christian. The church age baptism with water is a ritual baptism. It is the baptism of believers in the church age who have already been identified with Jesus Christ via Holy Spirit baptism. What has been previously taught about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is illustrated by the water baptism of the church age. When a believer is placed into the waters of baptism today, Christian water baptism. These, those waters represent retroactive positional truth. Those water rep waters represent the believer having been associated with the death of Christ on the cross through his faith in Christ. 
When the believer is placed into those waters, he is symbolically represented as being buried with Christ, who paid for the sins of the whole world. And yours, of course, that includes you. When the believer is brought back out of the waters, he is representing his current positional truth, that he's now representing himself as having eternal life credited to his account, as having God's absolute righteousness credited to his account. He now stands as one who is absolutely perfect in his standing before God, not his experience. And that is portrayed symbolically by water baptism. But it has been previously accomplished by Holy Spirit baptism. That's what actually did the work. Symbolic is the water. Your faith brought about the actual Holy Spirit baptism as done by the Holy Spirit in you. Therefore, Christian church age water baptism identifies a believer. All right, let's go back to uh, the sentence. Sorry for that phone call interruption. Therefore, Christian age, church age water baptism identifies a believer symbolically with Jesus Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that's all it is. It's just a picture. The placing into the water is not the cause of any divine accomplishment but symbolic of what God has already done. For this reason, we say that water baptism represents two things about the Christian. It represents retroactive positional truth, having been identified with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It represents also current positional truth, having Christ's perfect righteousness credited to one's account along with the immediate reception of eternal life. So you see, there is only one baptism which does bring about a relationship of eternal life with God in heaven. Holy Spirit baptism. So T.J. Jakes is trying to make a lot out of Holy Spirit baptism. First of all, he doesn't know what it's symbolic of. And second of all, it doesn't accomplish anything, but it's symbolic of what was accomplished by God in the believer. So T.J. D. Jakes says, the Bible tells us that as we enter the water during baptism, we are identified with Christ's death on the cross. Okay. His burial in the tomb. Okay. And his resurrection from the dead. Right. When we rise from the water, this signifies that our sin nature has been crucified, and we now have a new godly nature. <clears throat> Again, this is symbolic. Our sin nature has been crucified, but what does that mean? We no longer have one, and we don't exercise one. And now we have a new godly nature, so we should behave right. That's what he's implying. And this requires explanation that is tied to Scripture, which T.D. Jakes has not done. There is a sense here that T.D. Jakes is saying that Christians no longer have the capacity to sin, that the sin nature is no longer operative in them. That is wrong. Because if you get crucified on the cross, actually... You don't operate anymore. You're dead. <coughs> you said nature is crucified. It doesn't operate anymore. It's dead. But it isn't. This, the sin nature is still within the mortal being, even the believer, the Christian. So it is operative if one chooses to let it be in control. Even Christians. Even believers. Even believers. Excerpts. <coughs> from study on Romans chapter 6. Let's get this straight. <clears throat> Far be it the thought, such ones as we who died to sin, how shall we live any longer be living in it? Really, I should put um, <clears throat> six one and six two. so that's what I'm going to do right now. All right, I added back in verse 1 because you don't know if uh, verse 2 continues with verse 1. So what shall we say then, verse 1, are we to continue in sin? Paul is saying, we can, because he's saying, oh, we continue in sin, so that grace may increase. So if we do continue in sin, grace may increase. T.D. Jakes doesn't get that. He's saying, no, the sin nature is dead. Well, yeah, but Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? So you could choose to do that, just that the, you don't have to. And Paul says, far be the thought in verse 2, such ones as we... Who died to sin. See, it says you can continue in sin by raising it for the dead in your temporal life in the moment. How shall we be any longer be living in it? If we died to sin, why would you choose to go back to it? That's the question. 
And it continues on. So having died to sin, i.e. the sin nature does not signify that the sin nature no longer exists, nor that it no longer can have influence over the believer and make him do sin. Such ones as we who died to sin, how shall we any longer be living in it? Okay. Notice that Paul's question, how shall we any longer be living in it, implies that it is indeed possible that the believer can do just that. Continue in sin. And some believers, it says in the Bible, can continue to sin so much that it was worse off than before they became believers. So the believer still has the capacity to live in sin in spite of the fact that he has died, i.e. been separated from the control of the sin nature of his lifestyle. You can put your hand up and say, hey, sin nature, you no longer can control my life. Verse 3, or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, this is Holy Spirit baptism, not water, were baptized into his death, meaning that we have been separated from the sin nature. It no longer has control over us, but we can go back and give it control. As you keep reading in Romans chapter 6, you get that point. All believers were baptized by God the Holy Spirit, i.e. identified with and placed into Christ Jesus, especially with respect to receiving the benefits brought about by his death on the cross. So, Romans 6, 3a, first part of it, or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, or this conjunction begins an all-important point relative to the believer's choice of lifestyle, a point about him being baptized into Christ, into his death, burial, and resurrection, so that the believer can choose to live a new and godly life instead of choosing to go on sinning so that grace may increase. So it is true that we have a lifestyle now that's new, that's available to us. Which one shall we choose? See? So, Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So it means we could, and we should, but will we? See, he's raising it up. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? We don't want God's grace to increase to keep covering our sins, because we're forgiven of all of our sins. But, instead, since we have been given the opportunity to live a new life, why don't we choose that? So the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ provide the believer with the freedom to choose and the capacity to live a new life, a new ungodly life, or he can revert to slavery to the old ungodly nature which still remains within him. So here it is. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Far be the thought, such ones as we who died to sin. How shall we any longer be living in it? Or, or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus Holy Spirit, that actual, real, Christ says, we're baptized into his death. <clears throat> because what he died for, it looks as if we died for that, but he died for us, because we wouldn't come back from the lake of fire. We were therefore buried with him through baptism, into his death, Holy Spirit baptism, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, to the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ provide the believer in some manner with the freedom to choose and the capacity to live a new life, a new and a godly life, or he can revert to slavery, there it is, to the old ungodly nature, such which still remains within him. <clears throat> See, T.D. Jakes, T.D. Jakes, the sin nature still remains in us. Just read Romans chapter 7 where Paul goes to that. And he keeps saying he loses the battle to the sin nature, to the old man. So verse 4 in Romans chapter 6 <clears throat> verifies that this union with Jesus Christ by a Holy Spirit baptism means that the believer is credited with sharing the benefits of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, which includes complete forgiveness. The crediting to him of the righteousness of Christ and the provision of the enablement to live a new and godly life. Verse 6, 6. For if, since, we have become united with him 
in the likeness of his death. Certainly we should, shall all.